Um, so I'm Brandon Phillips. I'm the CTO and co-founder of CoreOS. I've been doing system software for a long time. I worked uh, at SUSE Linux, where I did kernel development for a while. And then I worked at Rackspace, where we did a huge uh, globally distributed uh, monitoring system. And then most recently, uh, co-founded CoreOS uh, three years ago with my co-founder, Alex Polvey, who's also a longtime uh, kind of cloud engineer. All right, so what is CoreOS? Um, who here saw the keynote? I know a bunch of people didn't this morning. OK, got it. Um, so we'll go a little bit deeper into what CoreOS is. Um, so CoreOS uh, is simply Linux. Um, and it's Linux that's been put together in a different way. Um, and it runs on all these different platforms. So it is an operating system. CoreOS Linux is an operating system. The company is named CoreOS because this operating system was our first product. And when you are starting a company, you name <laughs> your first product after the company. So it's like, it's like a debut album, you know? Uh, I don't know if Taylor Swift did that, but yeah. Um, so uh, CoreOS Linux runs everywhere that you ex expect uh, a Linux operating system to run uh, on the various clouds and virtualization technologies. Um, it's, it runs on this very sought after platform called Bare Metal. Um, apparently this is an up and coming platform. A lot of people are running their stuff on. Um, and so CoreOS uh, Linux is about an operating system, and then CoreOS as a company, as an organization. We build a bunch of other open source technologies. Here's a few of the technologies that we've introduced into the ecosystem. Uh, Flannel is our overlay net network technology that is used in Kubernetes, uh, kind of as a default networking option. Um, etcd, which uh, is our key value store. And then Rocket, which is our container engine. And we'll, we'll break down like what those things do later. Uh, so we're a large community of people. Um, CoreOS has a bunch of engineers who work on these open source projects, but we have a ton of uh, external contributors too. Um, we have uh, probably about 1,000 external contributors at this point. Uh, we have a handful. You know, most, most open source technology, I don't know if you're familiar with this curve, but you, you have a lot of people who contribute one or two patches, and then you have a handful of people that contribute three or four patches, and then the bulk of the people um, that actually are the core team contribute 80, 90% of the actual work. And so we have both internal and external contributors that maintain these projects. Um, we're also, uh, we're not set up as a non-for-profit company. And so we uh, also take these open source technologies, package them up and sell them as a solution for people who are looking to run their infrastructure in this way and want engineers and folks that can help them along their journey through training and services and software, et cetera. Um, so uh, that's, that's how we pay for my flights out here, et cetera, is through commercial software. Um, and we also offer a commercial product called Quay, or Key if you're familiar with French, um, which uh, hosts and builds containers. So why, why did we begin on this whole journey of building CoreOS, et cetera? So one thing that uh, Google has always been famous for is the way they run infrastructure. And the way they run infrastructure is by thinking about data centers as units of compute. This is what Kelsey was talking about during his keynote, which is you want to stop thinking about the individual server, and you want to stop thinking about the individual server because it gets you in trouble. It gets you in trouble because you get connected to that server. You want to like configure it by hand. Maybe you avoid rebooting it because you're running your database on it. Um, perhaps you forget that configuration change that you made 18 months ago by hand when there was an outage window, and then suddenly when you try to update it, everything starts to break. And so the data center as a computer is thinking about essentially uh, a higher level organism. If we think of the individual servers as cells, the data center is a multi-celled organism. Okay? And the entire process of these data centers as a computer um, begin very selfishly. They begin with application engineers, which is what I'm assuming I'm talking to. How many people would consider themselves engineers, application engineers of some sort, writing code for back end or front end web? Okay, so it begins very selfishly with you, the people who are actually trying to get their work done and go home. Um, and what you do is you take a bunch of source code and you transform that into a container image. Uh, there's really not a ton of magic here. It's um, We've, we've been doing this for a long time. You compile up your code, and you run it through CI, and then you get a tarball on S3 somewhere, and then you wget it down as part of your deployment process. Or you have the local copy of your code that's written in PHP or Python. You SSH into the server, and you get git get pull. This is just a consistent, clean way of packaging up your application. 
Um, that's what the container image is about. There's no magic going on here. It's just a bunch of files inside of a tarball that's extracted to disk. Um, and it contains everything you need in order for your application to run. So that's your language runtimes, the um, various libraries that those language runtimes rely on, like libc, et cetera, and then your application code itself. And what we do is we package all these things together. We give them some sort of name. Um, we upload them to some sort of hosting place. We hopefully generate a cryptographic hash. Who here is familiar with what a cryptographic hash is as a, okay. So cryptographic hashes essentially are a way of identifying uniquely um, a, a stream of bytes using a, a, set, set of, a set of bytes. So you have this very short string that uniquely identifies a long string of bytes. And so um, this is used in sort of all sorts of public key cryptography, et cetera. But the basic idea is that um, if you download something over the internet, you have this you know, 160 bits characters of string and you run the same hash algorithm that generated those 160 bits over the exact same input, you get the exact same output. It's, um, and so the, this is really important because we want to start to verify things that are downloaded over the internet before we run them on our computers. So what we do with these hashes is that we um, have the developers generate a signature uh, using public keys. Uh, that signature is then stored and downloaded and verified and on our servers or inside of our clusters, we say we trust Alice, our engineer, to deploy code onto our servers. Um, and this, this way we actually establish mutual trust between the servers and the engineers deploying code. Now as an operations engineer, your life changes a little bit also. This, this first part was about the application developers. And so for the rest of you in the room, um, you may be doing operations. And what operations uh, can focus on is less about, well, how is the code deployed? Because the code is deployed using containers. We have this one method of doing code deploys. And worry more about, is the infrastructure providing the resources necessary in order to service the application? And so as an operations engineer, your job switches to be more worrying about, do I get a set of servers up and running? And then I want to take copies of that application and say the engineer who wrote the application says we need three copies running in order to service the traffic that we're expecting. And we push those down to the servers and hopefully we, we do it in such a way that the software engineer doesn't care about how uh, the actual container is ran. Um, so whether it's being ran inside of an engine like Docker or it's being ran under, under Rocket, etc. We want to have a uh, a clear, clean contract so that the implementation details of how the operations team does their job is separated from how the uh, application team builds their software. Okay, so how do we actually achieve this whole process? Um, the first thing is that we uh, reduce API contracts. So um, we build an operating system that reduces these API contracts between the OS and the application, so our applications are packaging up everything they need, and the operating system is free to ship and again, change its abstractions internally. Um, so it starts to look like this, and no surprise, it's CoreOS in a container. Uh, and now we open up this new sort of realm of uh, operations, um, a new facet of operations, which is around operating system operations, and hopefully we're able to automate it. So operating system operations, we can automate through updates, similar to how our phones get automatic updates. Um, and we end up in this spot where, you know, at one point we have a distribution graph of, uh, of systems that look like this, um, where over time everyone starts to jump over to uh, the latest version of the operating system. What we clearly want to avoid is what Android does, um, where it looks like sedimentary graph. Um, or like sediments that's layered over the millions of years. Um, we, what we want to avoid is this state where people don't upgrade their phones. Um, and in this case, they don't upgrade their servers because you know, we broke API contracts or suddenly somebody stopped servicing updates or the updates got paused one time because somebody disconnected from their network, et cetera. And so our whole hope here is that we um, essentially start automatically updating the um, underlying operating system and free that up and free up this OOP operating system operations concern um, from the, the operations engineers. And the, the reason that we're able to do this is because um, a lot of what we think of as compute 
has been fully and 100% commoditized. So x86 has fully won. Um, I don't know if this comes as news to many people, but uh, x86 owns the server market. And um, this, this is an important assumption for containers, because containers are compiled down to one particular architecture. It's just like our Linux packages. And so we have this stable ABI on the processor level, and then we have a stable interface with Linux. Um, uh, if you've ever read Linus's rants at all on the internet, he has quite some famous rants. Um, they include a lot of profanity. And Linus's rants generally are around breaking the interface between applications and the Linux kernel. And uh, even though it's kind of funny to look at the outside, and it's kind of tragic if you're on the inside, um, it's an important contract that Linux maintains that it does not break applications. And so we rely on the fact that both Linux is a commodity and x86 is a commodity uh, in order to ensure that as we update the operating system, it doesn't actually break the application that's running inside of these containers. And that's why we're able to do this, is because these, these contracts have been so firm for such a long time. Um, and then we do this update where it's A and B partition. You run A, we update B in the background. So what CoreOS does is it enables um, automatic updates with rollback. So if one of these updates goes sideways, say you um, reboot and the kernel panics on the reboot, or you reboot and we're unable to uh, launch your application again, we can actually roll back to the old version on a subsequent reboot. <clears throat> so the other bit of OS operations, we've kind of automated ourselves out of this operating system operations concern of updating the server. Um, this is generally something that is done manually in a lot of cases where people will migrate from one LTS release to another, or they have this blind cron job that like, sits there and does app get upgrade, um, and then they get paged randomly whenever this cron job uh, triggers. Um, but we, we fixed the update concern. Um, so the next concern is actually operations of getting the server to be doing something useful, um, the machine configuration side. And the main concern here is about getting machines into, into a cluster of, of other hosts and getting work from them. Um, shoot. Uh, whenever this slide gets compressed, it starts to get really confusing looking. But um, what, what machine configuration about is essentially three or four pieces of metadata. Um, the first bit is who should I be talking to to get work? And so Kubernetes essentially has a single API server. Uh, well, it can be HA, but you configure some DNS or IP address that each machine, as it comes up, talks to to get work from. And this is the API server. Um, how do we establish mutual trust? So you want to configure the machine so that when it comes up, it can actually trust the API server and isn't just getting man in the middle. They're taking work from untrusted uh, uh, entities on the network. And then some other details like, you know, how do I configure DNS, et cetera. But the main thing is about what we do is we bring up the machine and we say, all right, congrats, uh, your boss is over here. Go talk to him about what to do next. And these machines essentially become ephemeral workers inside of the clusters. All right, so operating system operations becomes very boring. We start to worry less about the OS because the OS is just there to run our applications in a container. And containers aren't super complex to operate because the container is always downloaded and deleted uh, and ran in the same manner. Um, it's something that can be pulled on and off, on and off, and it doesn't actually change state on the underlying operating system. So now we, we open up for this whole new set of operational concerns, which is cluster operations. And the first bit is how do we get a bunch of servers to agree on a value, and how do we get that value farmed out to the rest of the machines so that they know what to do next? Um, and so we built a key value store called etcd. Um, actually, let's, let's go ahead and do a, a live demo here of etcd. So um, we have this thing that I couldn't demo this morning. Ooh, let's see if I can make that smaller. So uh, what this is is it's um, at play.etcd.io. Um, please don't mess with the demo because there's only one instance of these uh, running right now. But what, what, what can be done is that essentially etcd holds on to value. So you can say, for example, like load balancer, is uh, example.com. And so we store a bunch of data in here. Usually it's JSON, JSON structured. structured. Um, but we're able to write into um, the data store, and it gets replicated to all the other machines in the cluster. Um, and we can write into any one of these machines. So if we need to update it from example.com to 
example.org, um, and we write into a different member in the cluster, it doesn't really matter. Um, and the important thing here with etcd is that when you kill something, when you kill a member of this cluster, um, what actually happens is that um, the, the cluster figures out, oh my goodness, somebody's been killed, um, I need to recover from this, and elects a new leader. And this leader is the person who's in charge of ensuring everyone's healthy and accepting rights, et cetera. Um, and so we can continue to uh, you know, switch back and forth values inside of the data store as long as we have a majority of the machines up. So um, our write to example.com, or changing the load balancer from example.org back to example.com worked fine, and we're able to um, bring the machine back up, uh, and it gets replicated the correct data that the cluster has made while it was down. Um, and this is actually running on a live etcd cluster. So we have a piece of software that's sitting there and actually physically killing the process and bringing it back up and checking the overall health and doing all the writes uh, on this cluster. So if, if you want to play around with it, it's a great way of getting a sense of um, how tolerant etcd can be of in the face of failure. Um, any, any questions on that? Uh, feel free to like jump in with a uh, hand raise if you have any questions. Um, we're kind of covering a lot of stuff at once. Um, yep, so I didn't skip this because we have internet here and I don't have to see that. Um, and so uh, now that we have this tolerant place to hold on to configuration data, uh, what we can actually start to worry about now is um, what should be running in the cluster. Um, we have a way of holding on to data and so now we have the ability to build systems where a user can say, you know what, I need five copies of this running in the cluster and we have some way of, of making sure that happens. So this gets to the um, topic of scheduling. Now there's a lot of schedulers that are coming out. Um, there's things like Mesos, there's Kubernetes, there's Docker Swarm, uh, there's Aurora, there are um, just kind of a nomad. There's a plethora of these schedulers. Um, but really a scheduler is about getting work to the server and it's really a pretty trivial exercise to make a bare minimum scheduler. In fact, like essentially all of us have written a scheduler at some point. If you use Fabric or Capistrano or something, uh, a lot of our deployment workflows look something like this, where we compile up our application, we s-copy it over to a host, um, and then we just run it. Who here has used systemd run before? Systemd run? Who here has ran something in screen in production? All right, I get some chuckles. That's bad. Okay, so let's do a quick demo. <laughs> so um, if, if you haven't used uh, if you haven't used systemd run, what systemd run is is essentially the right way of doing screen in production. Um, so what it does is it uh, talks to systemd. Essentially, systemd is an init system that all modern Linux systems use, and so. Uh, systemd run, you can just say run some arbitrary command. So we'll do something really useful here, like uh, sleep 3000. And what it does is it says, all right, I'm running that as a service. And so you can start to do things uh, that you really can't do with screen, which is say, like, give me the status of this. Tell me how much CPU um, is being consumed, how much memory is being consumed by this. One millisecond seems a little high for sleeping. Um, and uh, et cetera. So you actually get metadata about what's going on, and also you're able to do things like get the, um, the journal output. Uh, obviously, sleep's going to be pretty boring journal output, but um, it's essentially a, a way of doing that screen thing that you do all the time, which is I just need this one one-off application running as a daemon, uh, but doing it correctly and having control over what environment variables get passed through, what UID it's running as, uh, so it doesn't have access to your private SSH keys, uh, and then actually puts it in a C group so you have control and insight into what, what it's actually consuming on the host. Um, so yeah, we've all kind of written these initial scheduler where we just build the app and let's copy it over, uh, boom. Uh, we've also like written for loops, so we use Fabric, and the Fabric just does a for loop where it's like, deploy the app and we just for loop over for i in each of our hosts that we know of. Um, we may have different deployments for different applications. Maybe these certain servers have special IP addresses that we've hard coded into DNS servers or maybe we like went off and we purchased uh, bigger VMs so we have like an extra, extra large VM that this one particular application needs to run on because it's really memory heavy, whatever. And so we, we write different deployments for different pieces, different services, 
um, to try to like load balance across our hosts. Um, and then we may do, do like smart things like maybe we'll loop over all of our machines and then find the one that has the most resources available, like the lowest load average, and then we'll deploy our application to those. And these are all just things that uh, we've all done because we didn't have the right tools. Uh, and so uh, what, what a scheduler is really all about is that you um, talk to a scheduler API and you describe your job. My job takes a gigabyte of RAM and it's gonna need uh, 1,000 milli CPUs, essentially a full core, and you push that um, off to the API, and the API talks to the scheduler and says, hey, I have this new job, and I need you to figure out where to land it. It has these properties. The scheduler looks and essentially keeps a hot cache of everything that's scheduled across all your machines, and says, all right, well, where's the optimal place to land this? Once it makes a decision, it just pushes that job or set of jobs um, to machines that have resources available. Um, so it's doing what we've always done, writing these for loops and using configuration management to land work, um, but it's doing it in a way that uh, essentially is freeing us from the concerns of where it actually goes. And so the reason we're seeing so many of these schedulers emerge is because they're pretty straightforward to implement. You essentially have a while loop that loops forever and it does a few things. It looks at the current desired state, so the user has desired state of, I want four copies of my application running. It looks at the current state of the cluster, which says I have zero copies of this application running, and it creates for itself a to-do list, and this to-do list uh, is what gets inputted into the scheduler. The scheduler can do anything uh, from doing very sophisticated bin packing, where entire research papers, entire research teams have worked on optimizing where, where jobs land, it can take minutes uh, to land a job in the most appropriate place, to pick a random number uh, inside the set of machines. And so you just are constantly doing this process of what's running? Is that what the human beings want me to do? Oh, it's not what the human beings intended, so I need to change one way or the other what the computers are doing. And so when we start to do this in practice, uh, we, using Kubernetes, um, we start to do things like run this, uh, run this container image, and I want one copy of it. And then a few seconds later, we actually have a copy of that thing running. Um, or I have one copy of it running, but I want to upgrade that to two copies. And then you, you get a new copy of the application outputted. All right, so let's go ahead and um, just kind of run through some of these examples. Again, feel free to uh, ask questions while I'm doing this. Um, what I'm doing here is that I'm using uh, documentation uh, that you can find at coreos.com slash Kubernetes. Um, I'm running this all on my laptop. Uh, under Vagrant. So we have, if you search for a single machine, um, we have this doc section here, uh, single machine Vagrant. Um, and it just walks you through installing Vagrant uh, if you don't already have it installed, uh, downloading the kubectl command, which is the API client to Kubernetes, um, putting it into your directory, and then cloning the Coros Kubernetes, and then finally doing Vagrant up. So to spare you the, the boredom of sitting through that whole process, uh, I, already have, uh, I already have a Vagrant machine that's running um, that is doing the, everything here, okay? Um, so it's, it's all just running on my laptop, and um, at the end of it, what you'll get is you'll get a functional uh, kube, uh, you'll get a functional kube cuddle where you can say kube cuddle get pods, uh, which isn't super interesting because we have nothing running, but in this case, get nodes. And we'll notice that a node is essentially these worker machines that are actually consuming work from the scheduler. And we'll notice here that we only have one node because we use the Vagrant uh, single machine. And so we have all of the components, the scheduler and the API server and the actual worker machine running on one VM. Um, so it's just a couple of commands and you can get this whole environment up and running. All right. So now that we have Kubernetes up and running, the first thing that we'll want to do is run through uh, getting our first application running. So um, inside of, I have a GitHub repo uh, called Hacks. Inside of here, we have 2016 Great Wide Open if you want to follow along at home and try to reproduce this at home. Um, and so <clears throat> the first bit is that we configure Kubernetes uh, to use this Vagrant single machine configuration. I've already done that. And the next thing is that, whoa. Uh, the next thing that we do is, um, is that we actually run uh, this, this container image. And so uh, 
we'll see here that I'm, I'm starting this container image that I built called host info. Um, if you're interested in that, it's, uh, it's also in the hacks repo. Um, so what will happen is we'll get um, that, that pod will get scheduled. Um, and, <clears throat> and so that work will have actually started on the cluster. Uh, where are my instructions? Um, and so what this host info service is doing is it's actually exposing information about the insides of the container. So the host name of the container, um, when it was spun up, the number of visitors. So in order to see that stuff, we need to actually um, get up and running with uh, a service that exposes it. And so a service you can think of as a load balancer. Um, in a classic three-tier app, we have our database, uh, we have our application, so host info would be 